Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Ocho. How are you doing? I am fine. And yourself? Tired. You tired? And I think I'm coming down with the flu. I was sneezing on Friday. Sneeze on Sunday. Sunday wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. Today it was okay. And now this morning I started sneezing again and by this afternoon, all my legs feel like somebody ripped me. Yeah. That's probably the flu. Sound like the flu for sure. Yeah, that sounds like the flu. But I may not get it that bad. I mean, I'm getting all of them on vaccination and booster and booster. I should be fine. Yeah, you should be okay. Yeah. I hear them keep some, but you need a full shot too. I think that's enough shots right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need no more. No more, no more. All right, so let's get started so I can go to my bed and take some meds. All right, so you all supposed to be working on that paper, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that means that when you when you write your paper, you should be able to tell me what is a check. Um, based on the trend that we're going internationally, why it's important, why they're moving from paper check to, I guess, the discontinuance of check, um, looking at what the risks are, and then you should comment on that transition. How do you think the public is going to transition? Because people, you know, people still write checks. But what you will see when you do your research is, a lot of the other countries that have actually discontinued it totally, they watched the steady decline of the use of checks. And that's something that you probably could do in your own institution to see whether or not there has been a decline in the use of checks. And then look at where we are going now in terms of self because we're moving away from paper and everything now is technology-based. So I think it's a good paper for you all to, to research and to write on because then it moves you away from the traditional form of banking to where banking is headed. Anybody have any questions? They started to look it up. Did any researchers so far? Um. Yes, ma'am. And I guess I can use our banking system at Scotia, like currently, and we rely heavily on digital banking. And so I can see that the decline of um, checks have been declining in our institution, where most persons would prefer to do online transfers and like wire transfers as opposed to writing a physical check. Mm -hmm. And that's not only just personal now, also taking into consideration small businesses. Right, small businesses are using like um, CMS, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. point of sale, as All a of it. So that's the change in the whole landscape of banking. As banking transition, because I, I heard this week that a lot of students don't want to study banking and finance anymore because they say that there are no jobs in banking and finance because the bank is, the bank is just closing its doors. But what they don't understand is that the bank is moving from brick and mortar. So that means it doesn't need the amount of people that it had before because of brick and mortar. But it still needs people to carry out certain functions. And that means that you have to retool yourself in order to meet the requirements for these new positions. The biggie lock off with Sydney said, um... I pay more attention to how, um, I guess, in our institution where um, we are a cashless branch, I pay attention more to how customers feel about us being cashless and how we are um, migrating more to using our digital platforms. And it's more so the older clients that don't really um, agree with it. But, I mean, I guess we're also moving away from that era. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so 
I um, pay more attention to that and take notes of, I guess, how certain customers feel about it. And in regards to the small businesses, like there are certain businesses that strictly use checks. So um, I guess I'll probably ask a few questions on how they would feel if um, checks were to be um, obsolete. Well, I mean, we're heading there. I mean, just by the governor just mentioning it and saying that's where we're headed. I mean, he doesn't need the public's permission. You see what I mean? He is the governor. So once he once the banks agree that that's where they're, they're, they're transitioning to, and you can see that's where the Canadian banks are already going. So it's only just maybe just the local domestic ones now to join and say, okay, we need another six months or we need another eight months or a year or we'll do a dual system and just phase it out completely. Right. So when, when you do your research now, you need to see maybe if you can find anything that wrote about the transition. And like how you saying it's the old, old people, older people who like either they're afraid of it or they don't want to let go. See if any of those jurisdictions mention how they address that. Because that could help you also in day to day job and trying to, to, to encourage people to use the digital platform. So that's, that's one of the key things in moving away from checks. Okay, so now I wanted to talk about ATMs. I think in my in my in my notes, you might have a different page, but I have it on page ninety three. And it speaks to the bank itself having a duty when it has an ATM machine. And that duty includes guaranteeing that the ATMs are designed, programmed, and operated to respond accurately to the proper commands of cardholders authorized to use the ATMs. And I know that Scotia recently at East Bay, um, they, they moved from having what, two to four machines. And I watched the customers getting all frustrated because they don't know which ones are deposit only and which ones suspends cash. So people just get frustrated. Even the one at Soldier, East and Soldier Road, you'd see people getting um, frustrated. Now, when I say people, I don't mean the younger ones, the older people. Because they expect that every machine will do the same thing. That's why you call us out like so. Mm, what you said? Yeah, you call us out like so. <laughs> we, 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 we try our best. <laughs> well, okay, but I could go to RBC. <laughs> if I go to RBC, RBC has only two machines. You don't like your money if you go to RBC. One take deposit. If being honest. If one take a deposit. And the other one is where you can get cash. Just two machines. But all of our machines deposit and um, just rent gas. The deposit is just like an extra feature. Mm. But all of our ATMs dispense cash. And soon directly, all of our ATMs will be deposited. Okay. Because I see that they're changing them out. But yeah, I see at RBC sometimes they're very long lines. Very long. Now, I don't know, but but everybody is speaking who, I know who buying at FCIB say FCIB is the best. I don't know. They say out of the three Canadian banks, they prefer FCIB. They okay, I guess. And RBC is at the bottom. Very much so. Bottom of the food chain. Yeah. But Scotiabank is the leading bank in the Americas. Just putting that out there. I heard you. And so you have to keep the ATMs in good workable order and always provide sufficient information to the bank of completed cash transaction. Another thing you have to look at is that, I don't know, as you move more into that digital space and having more of the, um, the ATM machines in different key locations, I think you sometimes have to look at, let's say the proximity. If you go out east, 
I think there's a Scotia in the pharmacy, sea grapes. If you look at RBC, there are the food, the gas station by Blanco Bleach. Right. Um, other than that, you'll have to drive to RBC, uh, Prince Charles Shopping Center. Mm -hmm. Or you'll go to Scotia on Eastern Soldier or Wolf and Jerome. Now, Scotia does have a ATM in the gas station on Prince Charles. In Rubis. Yeah, in Rubis. So that's, a, that's another thing, especially when, when one, let's say if East Street and Soldier Road, if all, let's say all of them are out of cash, it was a long holiday weekend. You see people driving all over the place, trying to find an ATM that has change. And then it becomes an inconvenience. I think First Caribbean um has the least amount of ATMs because between the between the east and the west, there's probably two. And I don't as bad. Mm -hmm. But I don't hear the I don't hear the customers of that bank complain. You'll hear RBC, you'll hear Scotia. But you hardly ever hear um, FCIB customers complain. So sometimes, of course, the machine, the ATM, fails to, to um, give you the right, the correct cash. And that happens, because that happened to me when I was short, $100. What happened is that when they stack the money in the ATM machine, they stack, what you call it, a filler. You know, that there's a blank sheet, like separating the money. That blank sheet was put in there. So when the machine counted out the $100 bills, it counted that as one. Because so I had to wait until they counted it the next day for them to confirm that that is what happened. So let's just say if the ATM dispenses more than you ask for. In law, you hold those extra funds as a constructive trustee because you hold those on behalf of the bank. And because you hold it on behalf of the bank, that means that you have to return it. So the bank should debit your account with the excess funds. Now, if it debits your account, then of course it can't ask you back for the funds because it's already taken it off. Now, if you as a customer retain those extra funds, you can't argue with the bank when the bank debits your account. And the, the bank itself could only sue for those funds if it made a mistake of fact. Which means that the bank has to prove that it has the proper records of the transaction. Because it has to prove its case against the bank. Now, if the ATM disperses no cash or a lesser amount, and mine was in the lesser amount case. And the customer account is debited. Customer's entitled to have that debit reverse and any interest adjusted to remedy the loss. Of course, you know, I got no interest. It's only one day. The contributory neglig negligence and the mitigation of the loss due to the actions of the bank should also be taken into account when reviewing the facts of the situation. And of course, if the ATM retains a customer's debit or credit card and prevents him from making any withdrawals, the inconvenience suffered by the customer will not entitle him to anything more than just nominal damages for the temporary loss of card or the use of the ATM. Now a bank cannot guarantee 
that all of his ATMs will be operational and they cannot guarantee that all of the ATMs will have sufficient cash for 24 hour period, seven days a week. They can't guarantee that because you know it's based on demand. But usually when a machine is not working, they should put a sign up that it is out of service. And you could do that when it's being reloaded. But you know, we could hear you all when it's being, because everybody's in the back there talking while they're loading the machine. So people normally say, oh, it's being reloaded. Or if there is power failure. But whatever it is that, that the machine cannot work when it should be working, every the notification should take place or be advised to the customer in a reasonable time remember everything to do with banking and timing is always about reasonableness and if it's necessary you could always let the machine is going to be down for a longer period in time you could always direct the customers to where they can go to another ATM machine that is nearby. Now the bank must ensure that the correct entries relating to the use of the ATM are made to the customer's account. Because the bank has a duty to account to the customer for his debit and credit balances. And the bank is always required to provide an accurate record of a customer's statement of account of all deposits and withdrawals made. The bank must be able to verify the details of an ATM transaction and proper inspection of an ATM's tally roll is necessary to ensure that each transaction or attempted transaction undertaken by the ATM is duly and properly recorded. So this brings me back to that social bank case that, that we looked at, the one with Pinder. Isn't it surprising that she said she, she, she did not use her card, but the person who used the card did not make any attempts. There were direct withdrawals. So my question is, how did that person get her pin? That's a question, right? She had to provide them with it. It had to be in someone who she provided that pin to. Because so I have a question. Good night. Good night. With, with this case with her, there wasn't like no no security footage from the ATM to see like who the person is that was using her card. Um, who has that case handy? Let's go to the first to the first one. Let me see. I'm trying to remember. Because her argument and at the first instance was that she did not give the card holder her pin. But with a card, you have to have the pin. And it didn't say whether this person, when they use, use the card, whether they use it outside of the jurisdiction. Because then you would say, um, it was probably a first who came here and skimmed the card, you know what I mean? Got an imprint and then used it elsewhere. It, the, the, the case didn't say what person, they just withdrew cash. And then that begs another question. How can you withdraw all of that cash? Bankers. What was the question? I think I think her argument at first was that the withdrawals were over the um, amount. However, I think that at that time the, the limit would have been increased, and it was within the daily limit. But 
it's it, it's day over day that they will join. So it accumulated to the amount I believe. But it wasn't like one set withdrawal. It was like several withdrawals day after day. Yes. Yeah, but the amount of that amount over thirty thousand that's a lot of entries. I agree. Thirty days in a month. I'll tell you, man. Yeah, it was a lot, $34,500. But does that not go back to the point that she was in my account so that, that, that falls back on her career? Yes. Because I'm looking at here where they say Mr. Ed Smith in charge of corporate security um, for the bank did show her some photos. She accepted that if the card and the pin matched that the system would not have failed. She was then shown photos of the defendant's supplemental bundle of documents, which she acknowledged seeing before. She, she, she agreed that she was responsible for ATM card and the pin. Hmm. I'm just I'm just trying to see how this went on for so long. And no alerts. Because even with a savings account, wouldn't wouldn't when when a withdrawal would be made, not the her alert say ping, there was a withdrawal. No, I don't know if alerts was a, a thing back then. Like this is 2017, right? This is let's see. Let me go back to it. I think it was yeah. 20. Yeah, 2017. Sorry, I don't think I don't think we had alerts. And it wasn't like we had to go put in online by again. No, 20, 20, 2015. 2015, yeah. It was that much. In 2016. There wasn't much online by again going on back there. Was it only um, ATM address or was it, was it like, you know, retail transactions as well, like online purchases and stuff as well? So that, could, that could amount to um, oh. accumulation of the thirty-four thousand. No, okay. Let me tell you what it says. It says here, um, she observed the following on a statement: between the thirtieth of September, twenty fifteen, and the nineteenth of February, twenty sixteen, there were numerous unauthorized debits on the account, each of the value of a thousand dollars. There were occasions where there were two debits of 1,000 each on the same day. The unauthorized debits were done via various ATM machines in New Providence. Of particular note, debits were done or the 23rd, 28th, 29th, and 30th of December, 2015. So during those same days, 23rd, 28th, 29th, and 30th of December, 2015, the plane had traveled to the United States. While in the United States, the plaintiff had the card in her possession and used it to make minimal purchases. So these are the questions that, that I'm looking at. So her and the person was using the card at the same time? That does sound right. This was, this was the first, the first, um, this was the first, this is her versus Social Bank or Social Bank? No, versus Social Bank. Her versus Social Bank. Yes. Okay, so I think I think because if I remember correctly, in, in, in her versus Social Bank, it was basically just you know her findings and her word against Social Bank, and then in the second one, Social Bank went and you know got the facts of the transactions and and what's not. So I think if we look at the Social Bank versus Simna. We find like you know the factual you know use of the um, debit card because 
I mean, if the if the limit was one thousand back then, or well, fifteen hundred, I can't see how you could withdraw. Two thousand. Yeah. Two thousand in one day. That don't make sense. I agree with you. So I think I think that was just huh? You know, you know, building her argument, but I think if we go to the second um, court parent, the second mm-hmm. case, then I think we find the, the facts because I'm sure Ed, Ed Rose would have, you know, presented the facts in order to win that, that case when they, you know, talk about the court. Okay, I see, I'm in the Court of Appeals and I see where she, okay, this is her again. Let me see if they talk about it. Oh, I see it here. I see in paragraph 12, the plaintiff was asked whether she was presently in possession of an ATM card, to which she replied, no, indicating that she wasn't able to locate her ATM ATM card as of September 2015. But didn't she say in the in the first matter that she had her card with her? Yes, ma'am. Then it says, however, the account statements confirm that the ATM card was used in December 2015 at several point of sale locations abroad. But that's when she was away which the plaintiff confirmed that she had authorized. The plaintiff then stated that she had found her card for su- such purposes, but that she had misplaced her card sometime later as she was at the time not in possession of same. So what, she lost it, then found it in December and then lost it again? Yeah, that does sound right. That's too much coincidence. The plaintiff in breach of her agreement with the bank did not timely advised the bank of the allegedly misplaced ATM card. Mm-hmm. If I have that amount of money on my account. But if, if you have that amount card. of money on your account right away, you report those right. reported loss or stolen. Right. And when you go to the ATM and you use your card, you get a receipt. You're looking to see what is your available balance. Like you have an idea in your head because if you all of that money gone and you only missed that, boy. And then, okay, so they say here, so in the circumstances, right, um, they canceled the misplaced card and issued her a replacement card, which was appropriately pinned. Then they say the plaintiff's claims were forwarded to the security investigation team, that's the ad. An internal review of the plaintiff's card history confirmed that all of the ATM withdrawers queried and said to be unauthorized were performed with the plaintiff's card using the unique and personalized pin, electronic signature belonging to the plaintiff. Then they say in November, 2016, she came back again and said that more funds were moved of her account. And again, upon an internal review, of her card history, it was confirmed that all of the ATM withdrawers queried and said to be unauthorized were performed with her card. So again, now she had, she had gotten a new card with a new pin. So how did this person get her new card and her new pin to withdraw funds? She, she, she provided that person with the um, pin number. Okay. I think it's actually that you know what that sound like to me. That sound like she had somebody could have been a significant other who was using a car, and then she find out she get mad, and it's the only way she thinks she can get this money back. That's the only thing I could think of. Yeah, because it's not it's not adding up. No, and that sound like that poison was close to her. Mm-hmm. If it was, I was thinking the close. Mm-hmm. So that that that's what that sound like to me. That sound like. Okay, she had somebody and she gets swings, so she can try put this on the bank. How the bank allow that? Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, but there are cameras, like you were saying, but I'm trying to see where I don't see no mention of camera 
Anybody saw a mention of camera? No. Because all they keep referring to is that as far as they could see um, the use of the card and a pin, and that's it. But I thought that's what the cameras were there for too, so you'd be able to see who was using this card. But if she changed her pin and got a new card, then how did that person know the pin? That was a boyfriend. Yeah, because it doesn't add up. <laughs> it doesn't add up at all. And then that case is so long. Yeah, that was um that was that was one on the ATM, on the ATM. That was too long. So the duties of a customer in relation to checks. No, let me just do the checks part. Yeah. The duty of customers in relation to checks, example, to take reasonable care in drawing checks and notify the bank of any known forgeries also apply to the use of an ATM or debit card. It should be noted that where a consents to allow or request the use of his ATM card by a third party, the customer will be responsible and liable to the bank for his use. And that's what happened in her case, correct? And this is under the term conditions of agreement because there's no there was no evidence they someone had taken it because if you think about it logic if someone had taken that let's say they found the pen or they heard it or they watched up that one time is no way they could have done it a second time and she got a second thought So it had to be someone who she gave consent to, or who forced her to give, up, give them the consent to use her card. And it says here the customer is responsible and they're liable for, for its use. The bank's use of the ATM's tally roll to validate that it acted on the customer's authority is important in matters where there may be questions by the customer of its use and or the unauthorized debiting of their account. Third party use of a customer's ATM or debit card may be due to the following. The customer has expressly, impliedly authorized the use of his card by a third party. The customer has acted fraudulently and is falsely claiming the unauthorized use of her card. The customer is negligent in permitting his or her card to be used by an unauthorized third party. Or the customer has not authorized, consented to, or being grossly negligent in the unauthorized third party use of his or her card. So customers are liable for all third party withdrawals made with their ATM card. Although not authorized, where such withdrawals were made by the customer's fraud or gross negligence. With regard to the use of ATM cards, customers should be advised as follows, not to allow another person to use their ATM card and PIN, unless absolutely necessary. That's like in an emergency. And they have to take all reasonable steps to keep the card safe and the PIN confidential. Now I thought that that part there would have been a part that the judges would have would have like nailed down in that case. Because to me, the nexus of it when it came to the appeal was you got a card, the card was used, you got a new card. How how could how how in the world can the same pattern that was taking place prior to getting a new one continue? It had to have been by a third party. 
and you implied, impliedly gave them the consent and to use your card. And it says avoid writing the pin on anything. If you're writing the pin down, write it in a way that only can be accessed and decipherable by the customer. So when you read, when you read the appeal case, you, you sum it up just like our Ellen is saying. I think whoever it is used that pin, when they went to use the card again, they realized that the card wasn't working. And that means that she had a new one and they wanted the new card and they wanted the pin. Because there's no way the first person if that was somebody on the street would have had access to get her second card and get the pin. So when an ATM issues a balance to a customer, it constitutes a representation by the bank to the customer upon which the customer will rely and they can arguably resist any claim by the bank for funds withdrawn by the customer. And so that's another thing. The person who had her card was able to use her card at the ATM machine. And if I recall, in the first instance, she was saying that she, she didn't use her card at the ATM machine. So the person, the third party person, knew how to use her card more than her. The bank must also ensure that its ATM displays and or dispenses a customer's account balance in a way that does not disclose it to a third party or can be easily visible. And that's all, all, always in accordance with confidentiality provision. So you all know there's a question, the final exam on ATMs and the pin case. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So for those who have been... I said, you know, there is a question on ATMs with reference to the Pinder and Scotiabank case. Okay, yes, ma'am. That's on the final exam, which we'll discuss next week. Now, I want to read you all something about the importance of IT security measures in banking relationships. So on the 20th, on the, on the 9th of July, 2020, the Federal Supreme Court issued a ruling addressing the liability of a securities trading company when hackers break into and use a, and use a client's email account to send transfers orders. The facts of the case are this. In 2014, a Turkish resident, a client, transferred some of his assets to a Swiss securities trading company whose assets were deposited in an online bank account. The client and the company were bound by an execution only contract, which contained a so-called risk transfer clause. Under this clause, the client expressly authorized the company to accept instructions given, in particular by email, and execute them immediately under any circumstances, even without written confirmation. According to the contract, the client assumed all risk, even in case of an error by the company as to the client's identity, and re released the company from any liability for damages that the client could incur in relation to the use of email, fax, telephone, or any other transmission medium. The only exception was in the case of, of the company's gross negligence. At the end of 2015, hackers took control of the client's email account, following them without the client's knowledge to use his email address, read emails sent to the company, delete emails, and send new ones. In one month, the hackers sent eight transfer orders to the company, ordering the sale of shares and the transfer of funds to a UK account. In total, the hackers managed to extract 
34,000 euros and 357,000 pounds of the client's assets. As soon as the hackers use a slightly different email address, the company stopped the transactions and asked the client for confirmation. So the decision of the court, the federal Supreme Court analyzed contractual practices between financial institutions and their client and the contractual allocation of risk between the parties. In particular, it noted that banks would absent any contrary agreement, have to bear the risk arising from payments to an illegitimate beneficiary. However, it is customary for the general terms and condition of banks or other finance companies to include a risk transfer clause, thereby moving the risk to their clients. Any financial consequences resulting from an undetected lack of legitimization or forgery, except in the event of gross negligence by financial institutions can therefore be contractually allocated to their clients. Absent any gross negligence by a financial institution, clients therefore bear the risk of third parties hacking into their email accounts. This also applies when clients act diligently and in cases of pure happenstance. Importantly, the federal Supreme Court considered that banks do not have to take extraordinary measures to verify a signature's authenticity, which would be incompatible with a swift processing of operations, nor do they systematically presume the existence of forgery or tampering. This also applies in the case of email instructions. Consequently, the bank's responsibility is not engaged unless a quick look at transfer requests shows at first glance, serious signs of identity user patient, like spelling or language mistakes that are unusual for clients whose identity has been usurped. In some cases, any oversight could constitute gross negligence and hence the bank would have to bear the financial loss. In the case at hand, the federal Supreme Court considered that the hackers had used sufficient sophistication in imitating the client's writing style so as not to raise any serious indications of email abuse. In addition, the transfers were made to a reputable bank in the United Kingdom. As a consequence, the federal Supreme Court considered that the company was not grossly negative. Because of the risk transfer clause, the client had to bear the financial loss. So the comment is, this case is a stark reminder of the importance for anyone using online accounts and online email communications to properly secure their IT systems against hackers and other malevolent third parties. In case of any suspicious activity, it is necessary to immediately assess the situation and react accordingly. Any comments? What do you think about that? Um, that was kind of straightforward, I think. Mm -hmm. But you see, it's similar in line to, even though this was email account being hacked, you see what the court said, right? That if the, like, when those hackers utilize the account, they use the same language. So the company couldn't be charged with gross negligence because on the face of it, it appears as if the customer was making the transactions. There was nothing to alert them. It's not out of the norm. And then if it is in the norm, it's up to the customer to alert the bank or the company. And so the client lost all of those funds. And so you see the risk, the risk in this whole new transition from manual banking to digital banking, 
I want you to notice that the risk is changing. The risk no longer rests purely on the bank. The risk shifts now to the customer. All right. Now, let's talk about security and property. So we know one of the products that a bank offers to its clients is loans. And we know credit to be secured or unsecured. And we know that clients are normally risk rated based on their credit history. So whenever you have a secured facility, there is a guarantee that is attached that in the event there is a default. And if you're lending to a large um, company, like a food store or a furniture store, um, and they're doing some type of project or expansion, then the security on it is always a floating charge, which means that the inventory is the collateral. Of course, you know, the inventory move. That's why it's called a floating charge. Or security can be a fixed or floating charge, and then you could actually have cash with that. Or it depends, you're going to even have shares. So banks also get mortgages. And when banks give mortgages, of course, then it falls under the conveyancing of the Law and Property Act. So when you talk about mortgages and security, and then you talk about land, so the first thing you have to remember is that nobody owns land. You'll own a right in that land. Land is owned by the crown. So even though you say, well, I purchased this piece of property, you do not own that property. You own a right in that piece of land. When you own land, Land is owned in two estates. One is called freehold and one is called leasehold. Freehold means that you own that property and you owe no one on that property. And that is called the simple absolute in possession. You can sell it if you want to. There are no encumbrances on that land. Or you can write it in your will and pass it on to someone else. It also means that there are no conditions attached to that property. So that's what you call a freehold estate in land. Leasehold is where you have a property that you own in fee simple absolute in possession, but you rent it out to someone else. So let's just say you own a piece of property outright and you decide that you're gonna um, lease it to Joe for 50 years. Now Joe in turns to make some money from this. So what he does is he leases it to someone else, but he cannot lease it more for more than the term that he has already agreed to. So he can't lease it for more than 50 years. So he can lease it for 45 years or 49 years, but he can't go more. Now, when you talk about leasehold, there are obligations on both sides. The obligations from the tenor, from, from the tenant, and there's also obligations from the landlord. And of course, 
if you don't ad adhere to the obligation, it can be a breach of contract. Now, there are also other rights in land. One of them can be an easement. And that easement means there's a right over another person's land. So say if you have a piece of land and there are two houses on it, one is at the back. The only way the person in the back house can get to their house is by passing through the yard of the one in the front. That is called an easement. You could also have water is flowing. Let's say if you have a farmland and the water flows through the property and it goes down into the other one. So that's another, another easement going between two properties. So everyone normally say that the purchase of real property is one of the most important investments that you'll ever have in your lifetime. And the sale and the purchase of a property all begin with a contract. So that same contract that we, we um, discuss in chapter three is the same contract when it comes to the sale of the land. The first thing is, you have to have a contract, an agreement for sale. And in that agreement for sale, it outlines the terms and conditions of the sale. It describes the purchase price, the deposit, the completion date, and there's the obligation that the seller has good and marketable title. The attorneys, for the vendor and the purchaser, they themselves have obligation in terms of if the vendor fails to provide or prove good title, then what will happen next? All of that is in the contract for the agreement for sale. The deposit is 10% and that's paid to the vendor's attorney. So once the agreement for sale is executed and the vendor provides the title documents, the purchaser's attorney investigates the title. That means he conducts a title search and he does that through the Supreme Court because he's looking to see if there's any liens against or any judgments against that property. Then he looks for all of the previous owners. And why does he do that? is because he's going to look at the very beginning when that land would have first been granted. So in land law, the purchase of a land is not entitled to require title to be deduced for a period of more than 30 years or for a period no further back than a grant or a lease by the Crown or by a certificate of quieting under the Quieting of Titles Act, whichever period is shorter. So he doesn't have to go back the hundred years. If in the last 20 years, that piece of property was quieted, he can start from that point right there from the quieting and come forward to the present. The purchaser's attorney can also ask questions or make inquiry about the title of the property to the vendor's attorney. Now the agreement for sale normally provides for a specified time period for any questions that the purchaser's attorney may have. And that's normally 14 days. And the purchaser's attorney can also ask questions about real property tax, um, subdivision approvals, survey of the property, whether there is any easements, any restrictive covenants. He has the right to ask all of those questions. Now, once he's satisfied that those questions have been answered, 
Then the purchase attorney will prepare a report or what we call an opinion on title for the purchaser and the relevant lending institution. The draft conveyance is prepared by the vendor's attorney and it will be reviewed at the time of requisitioning and looking at the cause list by the purchaser's attorney or subsequent requisition. The conveyance will include the name and addresses of the parties, any references to earlier title documents. It will describe the property and normally there's a plan attached to the back. It would state whether there are any restrictive covenants or easements or right of way. Um, if it's a foreigner, you'll have to give it of citizenship and witness and a witness to that fact and any other information that's specific to the conveyance. So once everything is appropriately, uh, appropriately amended and approved, the conveyance is finalized by the vendor's attorney and is executed by the vendor and the purchaser whose signature are witnessed. And then a completion statement is prepared by the vendor's attorney and the balance of the purchase price is paid by the purchaser or the purchaser's attorney. Less, of course, the stamp duty, real property tax duty fees. The legal fees could range from one and a half to two and a half percent. And that's paid on completion. Commission to real estate agents are also paid at the time and requests are made to utility companies to return deposits to the vendor and all utilities and real property tax assessments are placed in the purchaser's name. The conveyance is sent for stamping at the public treasury and the stamp duties to be paid on a conveyance are normally split between the vendor and the purchaser. And of course, you know, um, the government just out earlier this year, um, their changes for stamp duty for time homeowners and also for persons in apartments. So the sale and purchase of real property is a valuable commercial experience for all parties involved with the appropriate knowledge and understanding of the conveyancing process. The vendor and the purchaser and their attorneys can effectively and efficiently transfer title to property with more ease, flexibility, and skill. Any questions? No? So what exactly is a mortgage? A mortgage is an in property and is created as a form of security for a loan or payment of a debt and is terminated on the payment of the loan or the debt. The borrower who offers and grants the mortgage over his property is called the mortgage or and the lender who provides the money for the loan is the mortgagee. So a mortgage document specifically describes the parties to the transaction, the terms and conditions upon which a mortgage is granted over by the property by the mortgage or, and upon which the loan is given to the mortgage or by the mortgagee. And that's prepared by the attorney. The mortgage document typically includes, but is not limited to, the terms and condition. It outlines the obligations of the mortgage or to repay to the mortgagee on demand, the principal, the interest, and any costs related to the mortgage loan. To keep the property properly insured and maintained and regularly pay all rates, taxes, and assessments. And of course, to observe all restrictive covenants and regulation and protect title to the property. The mortgage document also gives you the detailed description of the property. It tells you the duration of the loan, what your monthly payments are, the date of the payment, and the mortgage or redemption of the mortgage upon repayment of the loan. And then it also speaks to the in the event of a default upon which the loan may terminate and upon which a mortgagee may exercise its legal remedies. That is to foreclose or power of sale or the right to possession. 
An opinion on title confirming or testing to the validity of title to the property is issued by an attorney to the mortgagee, who is often a licensed financial institution, before completion of the mortgage transaction, and before approval is for the loan to the mortgagor. It's important that the mortgagee satisfies itself that is legally in a position to grant the loan, and particular attention is given to the fact that it is not adversely affected by the rights of persons other than the mortgagors, especially in light of the provisions of the Inheritance Act regarding the rights of spouses and other pertinent statutory and common law principles. Because they affect the legal interest in the property over which the mortgage is being granted. Because remember under the Inheritance Act, the law then decides who gets the assets of the deceased. The mortgagee protects the security rights over the mortgage property against third parties, such as subsequent mortgagees or purchasers of the mortgage property by recording it and registering its security and lodging it at the registry of deeds and documents. It should be noted that the mortgage often takes possession of the original title documents, including the original mortgage after recording at the Registry of Deeds and, Re and Documents. Mortgages run in order of priority. So that means that whichever financial institution records it at the registry, then they are first in, in time. So when the mortgage has paid off the loan and the property becomes free of the mortgage granted to it, the mortgagor has effectively redeemed his property. So during the currency of the mortgage, the mortgagor has residual rights in the property known as the equity of redemption. The equity of redemption is the right of a mortgagor over his mortgage property, particularly the right to redeem the property at any time on payment of the principal interest and cost. The value of the equity of redemption is the value of a mortgagor's unencumbered interest minus the value of the mortgage loan. The laws governing mortgages in the Bahamas have ensured that the mortgagor is protected from any undue advantage by the mortgagee by ensuring that if a transaction is in essence a loan on security, it is treated as a mortgage, notwithstanding its form or the words of the mortgage contract and ensuring that there is no clause or fetters on the equity of redemption. So this is why you see once a person starts paying down their mortgage and they begin to have equity, then as long as that person can qualify, the bank cannot clog their equity on redemption, which means that once they qualify, the bank itself cannot say, no, you cannot um, get a further charge on your mortgage. Because the law says you cannot clog the equity on redemption. Now we know that the government has passed the Homeowners Protection Act. And that's a process to assist homeowners in making sure that they are their home is not, I guess it, it, it more or less stalls the process in terms of the bank exercising its power. Say. So once the bank, if the bank decides it wants to take legal remedies after it has exhausted the process under the Homeowners Protection Act, they have five remedies. First, they can, they can take you to court for an action for debt which means to pay the amount of standing. If it is a commercial enterprise, they can appoint a receiver. They could go after forfeiture. They could take possession or they could sell your property. Any questions on mortgages? No, yes. 
That's straightforward, right? Okay, so next week we'll look at legal issues, defenses and remedies. And I don't think we need to do FATCA and CRS because you all are quite familiar with that, correct? Those are not on the exam. I hear no, I hear no, no. I mean, if it, if it ain't on the exam, then no, no, no need to. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, you are aware of what they are, though. I'm aware, I'm aware of um, fact and not so much from the CRS. It's the first time I'm hearing, I'm hearing the term. What is it exactly? Okay. Well, I can briefly go over CRS next week. Okay. That's what you can. Because there's a lot, lot of reporting and that's done. Because FATCA is US common reporting standards to the rest of the world. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I could, I could briefly go over um, CRS. That's not a problem. Okay. So next week, we'll look at legal issues, defenses, and remedies. And we'll add to that CRS. And then I will tell you all what's coming on the exam. Okay, just a quick question. Um, in regards to the makeup midterm, I missed the first of three minutes of class. Did you go over it or is there any updates in regards to it? Um, I got some, but not all. I know I saw some came in today, and before that, I got one, two, two persons. So for those who haven't sent theirs in, I need to get it so I can add it on to the grades. Okay. All right. And then, hey, go ahead. Actually, good day, artist Robert. Yes. Yeah. Um. Did you get my assignment? Hold on, let me look and see. You sent it today, right? Uh, let's just say 12 o'clock. Yeah, I think I saw that. Hold on, I can confirm to you right uh, now. Little night. I unlock right now. I see Russell. 511. 511? That was that probably is like one. Like 135. Hold on, I see it. 1253. No. Yeah, that sound that's that, that might sound accurate. You should see my my scope, my it coming from my scotia email. Yep. Yeah, but there's nothing attached. Well, hold on now. I gotta look again. You say yeah. kind of attached, but only the Scotia thing spinning. Oh, uh, that's probably because I sound me. You hear me? I, I I'll resend it. I'll resend yeah, it. resend it. Okay. okay. Right. So, so yeah, I have Russell on. Sean. Ellen. On. No. Strong. I see it. No, that isn't it. Is it? Yeah, I have it. I have yours. Did you take your exam? Ellen, you took the exam? Yes, ma'am, I did on Saturday. Okay. I have to go and collect it then. Okay. So all the rest who didn't, please send it in. So I can mark it and send you your grades. Ms. Archer. Yes, my dear. So you haven't, you haven't marked um, my papers yet. I think I sent it from Friday. No, I didn't. I have it here. Okay. I have it. Worry not. Okay. I didn't know the others would have come in a little faster. But they didn't. But I have yours. Right in front of me. Very pretty too. I like how you put your okay. name, all your dress and all that on the top. <laughs> yeah. I see that. And Nadia, you know I have yours because we communicated already. Yes, mom. Yeah. So... 
I guess um, tapering, I probably may mark yours first because I have it right here. And then I'll look at Robert on and Ellen and then go from there. So all those who haven't done it, please do. So I can send you your grade. Natasha, you get mine as well, please. Let me see. Hold on. Sydney. Yeah, yours here. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yours. It's mine. It's mine. Who was that just now? Hello? No, I don't see that. Really? I sent it on Friday. Hold on. Let me go down. Mm. No. Uh uh. Send it again. Okay. Yes, March 15, 1985, Virginia, yeah? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I mark it and I'll send you all the grades. And then get ready for the final. And no multiple choice this time, right? Say no. Me personally, I I don't want to do it. No. Speaking for uh, myself, I, I don't know yeah. about the rest of the class. Okay, waiting for them now to say something. Multiple I, choice. I don't, I don't mind multiple choice. Multiple choice wasn't so bad. Yeah, um, you can miss me with the multiple choice. Well, uh, who, who, who said multiple choice wasn't too bad? Who was that? Uh, I, I don't want no multiple choice. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't like it. I mean, was <laughs> other than the questions. Yeah, sorry. I thought I, I, I thought when I told you all what I saw, I don't think that was a good choice. But anyhow. Yeah, we should have listened. I thought, I thought it was intimidation, Miss Hatch. I thought she was just no. trying to scare it talk. <laughs> no. Why, why would I be intimidating you all? <laughs> you all are very smart. No, it was not. Hmm. No, why would you say that? I, I, I feel like I, I underestimated the multiple choice. Ah, because you thought this could be very easy, right? Yeah, right. for it was, it was It was hard. Of course, they're supposed to be hard. They're not supposed to be easy. That's why I was directing you all towards the scenario. Because once you get a scenario, you're working in the bank, you can think about what you would do if you were in the bank. But when I give you a multiple choice question, that is not a scenario. That's a direct answer. Either you know it or you don't. Don't guess. Yes. Plenty of people guess. And the result <laughs> wasn't good. I mean, it's supposed to be a choice. All the choices felt like I didn't know. No, come on that is not true the choices were very good where's those papers i have here oh. let's let's go with structured question i'm giving you all structured scenario questions worry not that is where this thing is i can't even find it can't find the thing now that's the, the question because i was wondering where i was getting these answers from Y'all had me shocked. How was it, Ellen, when you did it? Hmm. Mm? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, it was okay. Yeah, tell y'all it wasn't bad. It was cases too. She wasn't that many. Oh, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. The majority of people just skip certain things like yeah what was, what was the legal reason in london joint stock bank everybody in their essays 
refer to London Joint Stock Bank versus Macmillan. So why in the multiple choice you couldn't put down the answer? You wrote it in the essay, you know. But you left it blank on the multiple choice. That I couldn't figure out. I found that very strange. And then I went to take my exam. Oh, Lord. What happened? <sighs> I, I go on in there ready. And when I reach in there, the woman talk for 20 minutes. And I said, like, Jesus. <laughs> Everything went out just right? Oh, they had said about 10 other students in there doing exams and she talking to them and um, give me your IDs and go through the paper. I, uh, I, I just could have put my hand on the desk and cry. And let me see. Cause um, I, come in, I come, I go on and there to just write, start writing with all I remember. And then look at this a easy question. Number 14, list three main legislature, which are directly related to the law of banking. And some people left that blank. And that was so easy. The data protection, banks and trust companies, regulations act, or the central bank of the Bahamas. Right. You sure, but, you sure that was the question? That did he say yeah. something about as it relates to minor? No, that ain't the one. For, no. This is the one relating to banking. Wow. Jesus, man, she make me mad. But anyhow, however, we get the exam. I just want to, I just, just like, <laughs> give, me, give me my medicine. Let me go. <laughs> Come on, I just say what y'all was thinking. I just, just give me it. Let me go. I, that's it. However, I feel like I didn't have enough time. Like that three hours went by so quick. That's, I mean, that's what happened today, too. Like another half an hour? No, I need like about another hour. I seriously, that woman, <laughs> she did me bad. Yeah, there's no other hour on the final exam. So you all want choices or you want me to just give you all four questions? Because you already have the research question. Let me know. Four questions would be fine. Okay. So I'll just yeah. give you. No, and so no, I'll... no multiple choice. Okay, I'll tell you all next week what those four questions are. Thank you, Jesus. So I'll mark the rest of these things and then we'll do that next week, study, because the week after you'll take the exam. You shouldn't need much time to study if you've been reading. But once I tell you what's coming, you'll know you'll have a week to get ready. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Everybody sound like they're a little happy now. It puts us in, in more hopeful spirit. Yeah. That it, is it can be a get now. The, mid, you know? the midterm always, the midterm is always like that because one, you don't know my style. That's the first thing. Two, you got to get acquainted to how to answer legal questions. And think, you have to think differently. So it's expected in the midterm. So there's no need to get depressed. It's a learning curve. If you went after this now and do, and do another um, law class and another program, you, you'll be surprised how much you've learned and how to think within the parameters of law. All right? So don't stress. Just come next week with an open mind as to where the questions are coming from. And if you have any questions on the areas, then is your time to ask them. Okay? Well, All right. Fun. Well, have a good evening. And Ellen, I'll pick up your paper. Okay. Okay. All right. So good night, everybody. Good, Good night, night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.